As we uh, completed last time, uh, we were together in the book of Colossians. It's the prayer of the Apostle Paul from verses 9 to 12, 9 to 14. And uh, I was thinking about that and thinking about prayer. And uh, we were going through a book while on, on our vacation. And uh, there was a chapter on confession and how important it is and so on. And as we were driving along and I was thinking and meditating on that, this has nothing to do with the Sunday school hour, but I'm just going to say it anyway, because just as we were praying, I thought, yeah, I want to share this. So um, <clears throat> I think sometimes as Christians, as we go on in the Lord for years and years and years knowing him, we, uh, we can fall into the trap of thinking far too well of ourselves. Because what we have in Jesus Christ, maybe just ever so subtly, um, we start taking credit for it and we don't even realize we're doing it. I don't know. Um, something that I was thinking about as we were driving along, I, I thought to myself, confession. And um, Lord, you know my heart so perfectly and I wish I knew it better myself. And <clears throat> um, But I... I I thought about something that actually initially was, you, you can almost say it was a little bit discouraging, but it actually results in a, a greater gratitude for the grace of God. Because, uh, and it, it stimulated my heart and mind as to, duh, yes, Dennis, you need to be confessing your sins all the time. All the time. So how, can, how, could, how could I help trigger that for you in case maybe... You don't even remember the last time you had a serious time with the Lord confessing your sins. It can happen with believers, you know. Um, so, as I was driving along, I thought, and, and I'll ask you right now, what's, what's the first great commandment in the Old Testament? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay. Now, how many have kept that perfectly so far today? I don't see a raising of hands. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be a sin if we did, right? Yeah. That'd be the sin of what? Pride and whatever else. Um, and then the next one is love your neighbor as yourself. Or we could go to John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, where Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And if I think about how much he's loved me, I'm not even coming close to that when it comes to my conduct with others. And so, um, what, what, what is all of that? When, when we do not, <clears throat> when we don't hit the mark, um, sorry for anybody with that name, if we don't, uh, if we don't, yeah, we had a woman in Ireland also by the name of Grace, and I would always say, I'm not talking about her. <clears throat> um, but, uh, we, we miss the mark all day long? All day long? Yeah. And, and what, what does that, what's the conclusion of that? I still don't deserve to be saved, but I am. And... What's the truth? Well, the, the truth from God's perspective is you and I are holy ones, saints, set apart, belong to God in Jesus Christ. And all this has been given. And I'm still a lawbreaker. Every second and every moment of the day, I could never measure up to the holiness of God by my efforts, by my what, what, but by the grace of God, what can we do? We can please God though, because of the fact that he made us in Christ and we are in him and we belong to him and we're saved and we're holy in his sight. We can actually do things. We lawbreakers in Jesus Christ, we can do things that please God. That would be impossible to happen. 
but for the grace of God. Amen. It's a reason to wake up every day so terribly grateful that every day I wake up, your mercies are new every morning. You're never going to let me down. Great is thy faithfulness. And on and on and on it goes. So maybe it's been a few days since you confessed sins. Just wanted to trigger you. <laughs> to help you to realize there's, it's how we maintain. You know, somebody asked the question like, uh, and there was a Q&A and Pastor was up here and, and he answered it perfectly, um, of course. Um, he answered it where, no, he answered because it, it was about the, the Beamer or judgment seat. And, and I forget who it was had the question regarding, are we going to answer for unconfessed sins? And it's, no, when we stand before Christ in judgment, we're going to be like him. Sins are all forgiven. Sins are all forgiven. Um, again, just a part of the profoundness of, of our great, great, great salvation. So what is confession all about? It's about having fellowship with God. Because he's still God. And he's holy. And so, again, can I walk through a day perfect? No, not even for a minute. But can I walk through a day forgiven? All day long. All day long. I can agree with God about what sin is. And I can thereby then have fellowship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John uh, chapter 1. Great, great book. I love to bring new believers into it. Um, because it, it's so honest and wonderful that way. And then in the end... I want you to be sure about the fact that you have eternal life. And, uh, and this is how we can know. Um, okay. That, that, that uh, non-confession of sin breaks that fellowship. Exactly. But That's only when we confess uh, that that fellowship is restored. Yes. And even fellowship with the brethren. Right. Because I know we've, we've downgraded a lot of things in, in our lives. Um, in Christianity, especially here in America, where fellowship is a bunch of food and people sitting around a table jawing about the football games and this and that or whatever. Whereas fellowship according to the word of God, that koinonia is we are all one in Jesus Christ, therefore we have this commonness, brothers, sisters, and we can only really enjoy that together and have fellowship one with another because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, goes on continuously cleansing us from all sin. The blood that saved us is the blood that keeps us in fellowship with the Father. Larry? And because of all that God has done, has done for us, we should be in an attitude of gratitude all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thankfulness <clears throat> is just not... One, once a year and Thanksgiving, it should be a lifestyle. Yes. And, you know, look for the good in every situation. It's there. You know, like in Pastor's sermon last week, <coughs> Thanksgiving, it was like, you know, if you got in a car accident, well, be thankful you had a car. and Or you didn't get hurt. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. There's, there's, are bad situations that we can be involved in, but there's good in there. Yeah. And we have to look for it. It's yeah. a lot easier to see the negative yes. in life, but look for the good. It's there. <clears throat> Sometimes you just got to look for it. There's that, there's that perspective, and then also when it comes to people, <clears throat> that's what love is, isn't it? Yeah. Love doesn't always look for what's wrong with people. Mm -hmm. That's judgmentalism and that and so on. Dreadful atmosphere to be around when a church has that kind of spirit. It's, it's, uh, it's not pleasant. But to love one another is to... It's not to be naive. It's not to have rose-colored glasses like moms and dads like to have with their children. Oh, my little boy would never do anything wrong. It's, like, <laughs> it's a monster, you know? you know, that kind of a thing. It's, there, there's honesty in it, but it's... But it's, it's it's uh, that's what love does, doesn't it? That's God's love for us. That's what that's what it's done through Jesus Christ. Yes, I see that hand. We well, mentioned love, and I had a sort of a new thought. 
given to me by I don't know who, doesn't matter, uh, asking the question, what is the opposite of love? And the obvious answer is hate, but it's mm. not. He says the, the opposite of love is selfishness. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, well done, well put. I yes. Think, listen, I don't want to take any more of your time because I know that. You're but you're going to, so just move on. <laughs> and it's okay. It's okay. If you'll forgive me and give me some of your time just for a second or two, you're talking about confession, mm. and I I want to admit to you that yesterday, well, I was driving up to church this morning, and um, I have certain things that I pray about on my way to church, and one of the things that I came to was yesterday. I chose not to have fellowship with God. <clears throat> after, after the men's breakfast, I went home, I did nothing. Absolutely nothing. And all the time that I was doing nothing, I kept having these thoughts. You really need to go in and you really need to look at Scripture. You know, there's a lot of questions you have. You need to, you have, you need to do this. I didn't do it. Hmm. So on my way to church this morning, it came to my mind and I confessed it. And I don't, I'm not faithful about every day, during the day, confessing my sins, but I know that there are more days that I do say, oh, mm. I, you know, I, I just, so I just wanted to interject that, that, that no. it's so important because I realized that not, confess, not confessing, I broke that fellowship. Yes, yeah. And that fellowship has to mean enough. Mm. It has to mean enough to want to never lose it when it means so very, very much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have us read, uh, and I'll look for somebody's help, verses 15 to 23 of Colossians 1. 15 to 23, and then we will see how far we get with verses 15 to 18 this morning. And uh, some, some wonderful, amazing word studies uh, that I've been able to enjoy, uh, and, and I'll just kind of share with you uh, so verses 15 to what I have here, 15 to 23, so we can take in our context. Would someone read that, please? Larry, thank you. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, that was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Amen. Amen. Now we'll go back to verse 15. I'll read it again, and then we'll take some thoughts from it. He is the image... Of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Um, two words leap out off the page for me, image and firstborn, and you note I've got them darkened. Um, if, if you pronounce that Greek word, it, it sounds just like it looks. It's, uh, we, we, know, we know the English word icon, right? When you think of an icon, what, uh, what does that make you think of? An image, okay, which makes it a pretty good translation, right? Um, anybody want to elaborate that on that? An, an icon? Someone that you look up to. Okay, okay. 
when I googled it, all kinds of statues came up, like a statue of Mary and a statue of you know whoever and whatever, and and these are described as icons, um, Idol. idols. Idols. Yeah, and yeah, that's that's the negative use of the idea of an icon, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, no wonder the Lord who is invisible, God the Father, says, don't make any images of things in heaven, things on earth. Don't make an image of me. How do you make an image of me? Get a load of me. How do you, how do you make an image of me? It's ridiculous to cre try to create an image of God or, or of anything related to him. Um, and so, uh, in the context of Jesus Christ, we have to elevate this word, take it away from the earthly way in which it gets used. Um, because there's a lot of humanly made idols, icons of Jesus Christ, and nobody knows what he looks like. He's always got either long hair, blue eyes, brown hair, whatever. Um, whether it's a picture, I grew up with a picture where he was knocking outside of a door. I figure that was probably the revelation setting or whatever. Um, a film that I really enjoy a great deal, and one of the things I love about the film is they never show his face. Does anybody know what that is? Ben-Hur. Ben yeah, you don't think of Ben-Hur as a film about Christ, but actually the underlying story is the story of the Christ and they never show his face in the picture and I've always really appreciated that I thought that was a good touch you know his hair was still quite long but um, uh, but but nevertheless never see his face in the picture and I am kinda like I like that uh, it's not necessary I've no one has any idea what he looks like and uh, we don't have to um, but what did Jesus say to Philip when they were in the upper room and Jesus said I'm going to prepare a place for you I'll come again and receive you unto myself and where I am there you may be also and and Philip asked him he said show us the father and 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 that that'll be good enough for us show us the father and what did Jesus say to Philip you have seen me. if you've seen me you've seen the father that's our thought right here. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This image, this icon, it's the original form from which is drawn. It's not just a mere resemblance. There is a Greek word when you want to just have a resemblance. Uh, something of someone or whatever that resembles you. My son, Sean, that some of you might have met around the wedding, he resembles me. Um, when he and my daughter Erin uh, walked into an English classroom at the Bible college they went to, well, lo and behold, their teacher for English was my teacher for English at another college uh, a little bit further south. I went to Baptist Bible College and I had Marjorie Williams for my English teacher. Well, all those years later, my, my two children our two children walked into the classroom and Marjorie took one look at them and said, might you happen to be the children of Dennis and Tracy Jacob? Because they look so much like us. Uh, Aaron looks a great deal like Tracy, Sean like myself, and they were like, yeah. Well, I had them as students all those years ago and whatever, and it was, it was really cute. They resemble us, but they don't look exactly like us. Jesus and the Father, there is, there is no difference. They're, they are they are one. And again, this is even a, the, the, the trinity, the triunity. Of, it's, it's a concept that there is no earthly thing. There's nothing in creation that helps us to go, well, this is kind of what God is like. I'm not going to talk about the sun and its rays. And I'm not gonna... I've seen people try to illustrate the trinity, and I ain't going there. I believe it's above creation. Mm -hmm. I believe it's just so profound and incredible. I just believe it like you do. And uh, Jesus is God. Jesus was God. He is the eternal son of God, has always been, always will be. And he is one with the father. And that never stopped 
the whole time that he was here. I saw a hand and I lost track of where it came from. I'm glad because it was mine and I lost track of what I was doing. Well, there you go. And we'll quickly move on. All right. <laughs> I remember. Oh, I wasn't fast enough. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Jesus said that he was the light of the world. Yeah. He also said that we are the light of the world. Yeah. And you mentioned the sun, and I've heard it said, or there's a song that I like, that I want to be the moon. I want to reflect his light. Hmm. Amen. Amen. In this life, that's probably about the best we can do. Yeah. Amen. Amen. John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 18. If you would turn there, if you want to hold your finger in Colossians, let's go back to this. It's another word that helps to bring out a very similar truth about Jesus Christ and about his likeness, his perfect image of uh, that of God the Father. <clears throat> and uh, anybody who is a serious student of the Word of God really appreciates the Greek word behind this. Somebody read John chapter 1 and verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, Sorry. he has declared him. Okay. We got competition there. Yeah. We'll new, pause for a minute. It's a new app. Oh, new kill the app. Okay. <laughs> There's a number of things said in this verse that, that Phil just read. First of all, no one has seen God at any time. Well, we just read a verse that said he's invisible. It kind of explains that, doesn't it? <laughs> no one has seen God the Father at any time. The only begotten Son, now we know it's talking about Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has, and then we got this word, declared him. Um, now, we've already looked at verses. He's the Word, all right? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word was with God. The Word was God, is God, always will be, because we see him coming back in the Revelation, chapter 19, and what's his name? The Word of God. So, uh, he's coming. He's coming again. But no one has seen God, Jesus explained perfectly who the Father is. That's why he said to Philip, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see how I act, how I conduct myself, things that I've done, the power I have. You've seen the Father if you've seen me. It's in a humble state, but nevertheless, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now this word declared is where we get our word for exegesis or to exegete. Uh, a passage. Now, what does it mean to exegete a passage of Scripture? Explain. To explain it and to explain it as perfectly and thoroughly every which way we possibly can so this verse is fully, fully, fully understood and explained. And that's the idea of Jesus Christ has declared, has exegeted, has fully explained thoroughly, perfectly, especially in this context, you and I, when it comes to the study of the scriptures, I, I'll confess that I keep going back to the same passages and I keep finding new, wonderful, beautiful truths. And it's wonderful. Spend my whole life coming up with a new word study and go, I never saw that before. This is so, this is so neat and this ties with this and oh, this is so wonderful and the Word of God just keeps leaping off the page for us. Um, <clears throat> Jesus completed that perfectly. There's, there's no, like, Jesus is the Scripture in flesh, and He perfectly explains the Father. There's, there's not a jot or tittle missing, as it were, as far as this is who the Father is. This is Jesus Christ. He's perfectly, fully expounded and explained who the Father is. That's why he said what he said to Philip. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So that's, there's probably more than a couple of these words, but uh, for the sake of time, uh, the image. And uh, that's, that's a perfect image and reflection. Um, an explanation of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the image, the icon 
Um, we should have no other icons in our life, right? Just one, Jesus Christ. Just one, God Almighty. Um, anything else would be an idol, wouldn't it? An icon. Um, Jesus, um, yeah, no reason to ever thirst or hunger ever again because to receive Him is to receive God, is to receive it all, to receive the Creator, Maker of all things, which goes on and gets explained. So we're back in Colossians in verse 15, and it says... He's the firstborn over all creation. Now, I believe we touched on this word already. Firstborn, prototokos. And it doesn't mean born first, as in time. It can. But in this context, that doesn't relate at all. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, in other words, when David was described as being God's firstborn, that wouldn't make any human sense. Because we know David was like down the line and he had a bunch of bigger brothers, didn't he? He wasn't the firstborn of God that way. He was the firstborn of God because God was going to elevate him to the top position within the nation. He would be king over Israel. And that he was. And, uh, and then also um, we have the nation of Israel is described as God's firstborn. Now, was Israel the first nation on earth ever made or developed or created? No. No. There would have been others. But was there any other nation on the face of the earth that God said, I'm going to make you my people? And so that's going to elevate you to being the most important nation on the face of the earth because you're mine. There's no other nation like you on the face of the earth. Your mind. That's what the church is now. We are a nation. We are, we are now uh, not replacing, but Israel's been set aside. We are now that holy nation, that peculiar people, that wonderful expression in the old King James, that um, people that are exclusively belonging to God. And when God takes us out of here, He is then going to deal with Israel again and and bring out a remnant of believers from them and they will be his unique people, special people again. And so we know that he has not forgotten them and they have a future with God. Um, but uh, that's the idea of this word firstborn. And as it's applied to Jesus Christ, um, he is not just king over Israel as David was. What's the, uh, what's the expression described of Jesus Christ in the scriptures? He is king of kings. And you capitalize the first one and make the next one small. <laughs> he is king of kings. He is the king over all kings. He is superior above all creation. He is the firstborn of all creation. So that doesn't mean he was born first or as some of the cults want you to believe, he was created by God the Father. That's not even implied here. That's not even remotely true. And that is, that's, uh, that's anathema. That's, that's heretical doctrine um, to bring Jesus Christ down to that level. Because we know he is the eternal son of God by all that scripture reveals. And he is God. So he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So he is the preeminent one. He is the chief over all creation. Makes perfect sense since he created everything. As it goes on and says, right? So verse 16 goes on and reads, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Now, if we want to get into some God talk for a moment, we would say God the Father created. We would say the Holy Spirit created. We see Him back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. So this is, and, but then we also know from scriptures in John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So he made everything. So if we say Christ made everything, Spirit of God, God the Father, 
I just call that God talk because God did it. And as we say God did it, we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth. And so it is enough to say Jesus Christ created everything. There's not anything in creation that he did not create. And that's perfectly accurate. And that's the sum total statement. You don't need to feel as though, oh, I, I need to include the Holy Spirit and the Father in that. It's a complete statement in and of itself. Because he is God. And yet if I were to say the Father is the, he's the Father of all creation. He created all things. I could say that and be very comfortable and I wouldn't have to say any more. Because in every one of those statements, you have a very complete statement. Because as you speak of the Son, you speak of the Father and the Spirit. It's in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, right? That's what we learned from this book. Now, I, I don't want to try and do the math in that. I don't even want to try and make that logical because it isn't. I don't believe it is. It isn't. But it makes perfect sense in that that's who God is and that's how the Bible describes him. Which on the one hand, if, if I just wanted to just be logical, I could get really frustrated. But I like to just praise the Lord and go, wow, I can't, I can't figure out anything about you. Because you're too big, too amazing, too beyond all of your creation. And why shouldn't he be? Why shouldn't he be? Um, there's where the cults go desperately wrong. And I think all religions of the earth, all of their gods are very human. All of their gods are easy to figure out. And, you know, and they're actually, they're just not even nice. They're just, whew. Not gracious like our God. Now let me ask a question in light of this amazing truth. What do these two expressions mean? There's two expressions. Twice it's mentioned, all things created by Him. At the beginning of the verse and at the end of the verse, all things were created by Him. Just worded a little differently, but then there's an extra point made. It says, and for Him. Wow, what an expression. That's really something is created by him and for him. Now, I want to stop and pause and take a moment to, because this is the real important part of any Bible study is, let's think about the application of just that profound thought right there. Because there's a lot of profound thoughts in the scripture, but we need to let them trickle down into our hearts and our minds. Marcus. What came to mind is the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the earth showeth forth His handiwork. Um, they were created for Him, but as we look at them, um, one thing that some bus drivers complain about is that they have to get up so early. I love getting up and seeing the stars as I walk out from my mm. car or <clears throat> my bus um, and then see the sun rises and then and now that I'm up in Shelburne, wow, it, panoramic views take my breath away every day. And so that's how it brings glory to Him. They were created for Him. I mean, certainly they were created for us. Yes. But the response has to be worship. So there's an application of praise, worship, going, not looking at the stars and going, aren't you amazing? But isn't the one who put him there and spoke and has a name for everyone, isn't he something? <laughs> isn't he amazing? Larry. Ephesians 2.10 came to my mind. For we are his workmanship, or oh. his masterpiece, hmm. created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we were created <clears throat> by him, for him, to, for us to do good works. You know, to bring back, to cast our crowns at his feet in the future. So there's a, there's a profound sense in which, like we, we use the term born again and we say we got to be born twice. We need to be born again, born of the spirit, not just of the flesh, right? We understand that. We also got to recognize as believers that there's a sense in which we were created twice. We not only physically came into existence and being, 
again, all just by the, by the power of God, enabling such a thing to take place and go about. But then we were created again as new creatures in Jesus Christ. That's the terminology new, used. New creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I put down Psalm 24 and verse 1 to help us in our application. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. The earth is the Lord's. Because it goes on and says after that, for he founded it upon the seas. He established it. He's the creator. He's the maker of it all. And he made it all for himself. Therefore, it's his. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's his. The world and those... Oh, that's you and me right there. Those of us who dwell therein. What's the application of that? The world belongs to God. It's his. And so do you and I belong to God. We are owned by him. And again, I could almost say like twice. <laughs> um, owned because every creature on the face of this earth he owns and they belong to him. And then, uh, and then in light of what he's done for us, so we can be sitting here talking about eternal things that only God could open up our eyes to. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a twice thing. The world and those who dwell therein. That's, uh, that's something so worthy of our pause and of our meditation. Because, you know, um, as Americans, you know, we fought for our independence. We love our independence. We love the freedom. Um, and we get maybe the wrong idea of what freedom is. Um, in Jesus Christ, in God, and our eyes should be open as believers because this book is now alive for you and I. We belong to Him. We are owned by Him. And that's, that's, a, that's a big pill to swallow, isn't it? Um, because my pride would want me to say, nobody owns me. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. And I'm going to determine and decide my own life and whatever. And God comes along and says, everything was made by Him and for Him. And that, that's a very, very, that's stewardship comes in with that, doesn't it? Not just about everything we own. To say, this isn't mine. This is first the Lord's. And then He's made me a steward to be responsible for all that I have in this life. Including my children. My grandchildren. Everything that I have in this life belongs to Him first. Including my own life. And... There is where, you know, study is something real quick. You know, I can look up a Greek word and I can put together and go, here, this is what this means. Then the real important part is what really takes a long time. It's the meditating on that. Mm -hmm. And it's stopping and being willing. Now, if you're too proud, you do not want to go where I was just talking about. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. If you want to have your own life, you just, you're not going to go there. If you want your mind to be renewed so your life can be transformed and you're humble enough to just lay yourself out before God and say, what's being said is true, I accept it, I believe it, and I'm going to act upon it by, by working it out in my heart and in my mind. So i got to think about everything I own and possess, including my own self, and is there anything that I've not given and surrendered and said, Lord, this is yours. Lord, this is yours. My private time, Lord, this is yours. This time, whatever, this is yours. All of this is yours because your word says so. That's application. That's life-changing stuff, isn't it? That's where the Holy Spirit of God gets real excited inside of you. And, and is full of joy because He is joy. And He will...
produce in you uh, Jesus Christ. Because that's, a, that's the very direction you're going when you're surrendering, surrendering, surrendering. Then we just become more and more like Jesus Christ. And this expression right here, all things were made by him and for him, is, uh, is so deserving of our, of our meditation. <clears throat> well, we'll pick it up uh, next week, Lord willing, with verse 17. And... Uh, and go from there with that word consist and other profound, amazing truths about Jesus Christ. We can see the progression. In Paul's prayer, he began with petitions. He was praying on behalf of the church. Lord, would you do this for the church and spiritually helping them, strengthening them and so on. Um, knowing your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Then he goes on to thanksgiving and thank you, Father, and thank you, Son. And then he goes on and he gets all excited about the Son and he says, and this is what he's like. So he goes into praises. So it's from petition to thanksgiving to praises of Jesus Christ. And God loves our praises. because And, and he's so at home with that. Because he's so deserving of that, isn't he? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this little season in your word here. and It's, uh, it's your word, not our own. And so we thank you so much for speaking to us and to our hearts. Because we need to hear from you ever so desperately. And, and we give you thanksgiving for this time and for the hour ahead of us, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit would have free course in this room to do and to accomplish his end. In Jesus' name we pray.